You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Hey everyone, this is the Dave Bullis Podcast. Uh, no real notes this week, so let's just get right into it. Uh, this week's guest is the founder and CEO of Buck Productions. Uh, you know, Buck Productions has done over like 80 different projects, and they're a lot of they're pretty varied, and that's a lot of the questions I ask too, if that hurts or helps them, because it's everything from, you know, the movie Wolf Cop, if you've seen that, uh, which is, you know, a pretty standout project, uh, to some of like the other episodic things they're doing now. So we talk about all that stuff, how things have changed from when he started it in ninety four to now. Um, and how you grow a company by yourself, which is kind of you know what what most of us are trying to do with content creation. So without further ado, this is episode two thirty five with guest Sean Buckley. You're listening to the Dave Bullis podcast. A little clunky, a little bit like moving through quicksand. I mean, technology has taken us to a point where you can get into the game of content creation like immediately. Um, my 11 year old daughter can grab her phone and cut something, and it's fantastic, probably better than some of the stuff I was doing back in the day. But um, back then, when you're trying to start something, um, yeah, it's just a little bit more clunky. And um, so you're, you're, you're slower and there was more heavy lifting to create content, if you will, um, back in 1994. You know, and you mentioned about content creation because like back then you had to – if you wanted to show somebody something, you had, you had to actually put it on a VHS tape, mail it, or you had to actually print out a whole kit. So, you know, I mean that's a challenge in of itself because, it, cause, you know, all that costs money. It does in time, right? So – you're not you're not in a situation where you can be working on, you know, multiple projects at any given moment, um, because it's just it's just a bit more laboring to get projects done. And as you say, just the physical delivery of it, you're absolutely right. I mean, the editing of it was, you know, it wasn't linear. Or sorry, it was linear. It wasn't digital. So you're not, you know, you're making big linear analog shifts and changes, but you're just again a little more time consuming. So, you know, what was the impetus to start your own production company in 94? I um, I just always loved the concept of storytelling. And um, and I love creating. So for me, it was a bit of a leap of faith. I left a job in publishing and advertising. I was a little older to the game. So imagine a 26-year-old being a PA on set, sweeping studios, dragging cables. That was um, That was me starting literally starting in the business. Um, but it was, as I say, kind of fueled by blind optimism and fear. I wanted to build a business of my own. Um, I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit and I wanted quite frankly, it to be doing what I was very, very passionate about. So it was in the world of storytelling. So when, when you finally did actually you know, start your own production company and everything, you know, how, how did you go about making your first project? Because I imagine, you know, like you, you could just, you know, uh, alluded to, Sean, you probably got, you know, when you're, when you're first starting out, I mean, at least in my experience as well, when you're first starting out, you kind of get a lot of eyebrows um, because they're like, you know, can you, you know, can you do this? You know, can you finance this? Do you know how to do a budget? All that good stuff. So when you first started out, you know, your first project, you know, what were some of the challenges with that? Um, well, you know, literally, you know, going through the school of hard knocks, right? Like understanding it, learning it, um, and quite frankly, f- failing and using kind of failure, if you will, as fuel to motivate you, to teach you, to, you know, make sure that you're continually moving <clears throat> on towards, you know, understanding the landscape better, understanding execution better, understanding your craft better. Um, and yeah, first projects were the result of cold calls, you know, Hey, do you want to do a corporate video? Click. Mm, hey, do you want to do a corporate video? Click, mm, you know, rinse and repeat. And then moving into things like, uh, uh, music videos and stuff where artists were clinging to you as quite frankly, as kind of much as you were clinging to the artist in this leap of faith. So, you know, not big budgets and stretching, you know, stretching the investment or whatever investment you could get, be it your own personal one that you were 
you know, you'd salvage together um, to put something on a reel to somebody taking a chance on you. And then you just putting it on the screen and organically building your work, your, your portfolio. Because at the end of the day, um, that, that reduces the eyebrow game. It's like, so what, what is it that you do? Well, this is what we do. And when they see your work and you kind of get to that stage, um, <clears throat> you start to see just some more success in, in getting more and more projects. So, so Sean, you, you, you touched on cold calling. Um, that's something I've had to do as well. Um, not only just for this, but like, you know, not only just for, you know, getting, talking to investors or what have you, but also, uh, you know, I had an internship in college where they made me just do cold calling all day. Uh, so, you know, the, the, and, and here's the funny part, Sean, the, the list that they had was a bunch of like former clients. It was like an amalgamation list, right? It was like former clients, yeah. current clients, all this stuff, right? So they were like, why don't you just sit in this room and call these people all day? So I would sit there, Sean, for like two hours every day after college calling these people. And more than half were like, wait, wait, they were like, who are you? And I said, oh, you know, I, I'm Dave, uh, you know, calling from, you know, I won't say the company, but I, then I'm calling from this. They were like, why are you calling me? I'm like, well, you know, they're running this deal, whatever. And most of the time they would just hang up on me. Um, one yeah. person freaked out. Uh, it was a woman who was no longer a client. And I mean, like this woman was like freaking out that I even called her. She was like, why would I do business with this company again? What the hell yeah. is wrong with this? What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> and I go, I'm, I'm just some college intern. I'm sorry. So, yeah. <laughs> so you know, when, when you were cold calling, did you have a list of contacts that you already knew would, would, would maybe be interested? Uh, you know what? It, it's, for starters, is I love the concept of, you know, a, a path, a path, uh, a pathway into what it is that you want to achieve or accomplish is riddled with uh, resistance. And so, if you were to just take the word "cold calling," I mean, you obviously immediately like you went, "Oh my god!" because it took you back to a place which was really, really hard to do. And that's interestingly enough an interesting concept to look at now is in the landscape of content because there was numerous paths to or or barriers to entry if you will so it was a you know cold calling reaching out trying to get people to give you a shot yeah you know you're picking up the phone hi you own a whatever a flea market do you want a really cheap commercial no don't ever call me again click next call well uh, you know all the way through to <clears throat> working as a pa and you know dragging gear and passing coffees but even there you're cold calling it is a different cold calling it's an organic cold calling it's a networking thing where you're like hey you you're an assistant cameraman can you borrow a camera on the weekend and maybe i'll produce and direct this thing and you can be the dop and so you're and let's do this and then we both walk away with something for our reel so you're just constantly moving through the barriers to entry into what it is that you want to do now it, in content now what i actually love is the barriers of entry have been reduced. So that is, and I'm not talking so much the cold calling. I mean, probably most of your audience wouldn't even know what that concept is. But um, it's it's striving to be given an opportunity, getting that opportunity any way that you possibly can. But once given that opportunity, um, technology has reduced those barriers to entry so that you can deliver on set opportunity. Um, you can get access to gear. You can shoot digital. You can get a camera at next to nothing. You can frame it up. You can cut it. You can add music. You can, you know, you you don't need to drag around a big machine like shooting on film, editing, uh, you know, cutting on an Avid or some of those massive um, editing suites, which were, you know, the only way to kind of get in the editing game back in the day. Film processing, the cost of film, like you're not dragging around these big chunky behemoths to get to get the project done that you have been given the opportunity to do. And so what that does, and I'm, I'm and I love it, is it levels the playing field a little bit uh, so that, you know what, you know, you want to go and shoot a small, you, you, ha tech, you, can, get, you can get access to the gear. Uh, it's affordable. You can execute it. But what it doesn't reduce and the one commonality is your your ability to or, or your want or your desire or your um resilience to press through to get that opportunity to deliver a piece of work for the client to to, to deliver the you know 
the project that you have been given the opportunity to execute. Yeah, it, it's uh, you know I, I like the, uh, the the idea too of the what you have to you know kind of resistance the barriers to entry until you can get, finally get to do what you want to do. Um, you know, that's what a lot of, and that's why I'm kind of asking a lot about, you know, the, the early start here is because a lot of this is, is, you know, people tend to, whether they went to film school or they didn't go to film school like myself, you know, you kind of want to go out there and you realize the barriers to entry now are, are a little bit lower. So where you don't have to lug around a bunch of stuff, you can make a movie, um, you know, hell, we had Sean Baker on, on here who uh, made a movie with his iPhone. Uh, that yeah. was Tangerine. Um, and that, and you Tan- know, Tangerine was fantastic. Like again, and, and nobody in that audience sat there and said, I'm not enjoying this film because he shot on his iPhone or the exact opposite. You know, I, so I, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. It, it and that, that's just kind of like, you know, that, that's why I think, you know, with content creation, the way it is now, um, and some, and, and I'm kind of jumping ahead, but I figured I'd ask this question now is, you know, Sean, do you feel that the market is kind of oversaturated right now because they have YouTube, you have Hulu, you have Vimeo, you have Netflix, all these other things? Or do you think that the market is – it doesn't really matter because the quality is always going to be there? Um, Meaning that – No. Okay. Go ahead. I was going ahead. to say because I know sometimes you could hear you know people will lament and say like, oh, my project would have been this, but it got buried by 10 other things that was released the very second I released it. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't listen. There's a lot of content out there, but for the, you know, we've gone through a content um, revolution and primarily in the way that we've shifted from the audience um, having content pushed at them. You will watch this show and you will watch it at eight o'clock and it will be Thursday night. So go destination viewing, sit on the couch, turn your TV on and watch your show versus content now. Um, and the audience pulling content to them. So what that's created is a ferocious appetite for content. So is there more? Absolutely. But is there more of an appetite for content? And the answer to that question is absolutely. Now, and and the ability to digest content. So rather than watching that show once a week and stretching it out, and then the content machines in a sense, okay, well, we don't have to deliver season two until this time. It's like, well, how about this? How about we spend seven months and we, we exe- create, execute, deliver, and distribute to Netflix or one of the other OTTs an entire series? I'm like, I mean, like 10 one hour episodes, and that's consumed in a 48 hour window. And it's like, we want more. <laughs> so it's like, it, wow, okay, guys, uh, we don't remember that seven, remember that four, three, three to four month window that we all thought we had? Well, that's been reduced to 48 hours. Go. Here comes season number two, like now. So this, there is. And I think that there, there'll be a, there'll be a, there'll be a settling, like, you know, some of the OTTs will, you know, grow. Um, some of the OTTs will disappear. Some of the OTTs like Disney Plus will come into the marketplace, like a King Kong. Um, and, you know, instead of it, you know, them kind of hitting a billion dollars worth of subs in the course of a year, they'll do it in that one 10 hour window. Uh, so, but then there's also be like, you know, distribution channels that just kind of start to, to disappear and the content and the opportunity to drop content on those other channels that are in a sense disappearing, um, that will reduce the content that's out there. Some of it, but when we are, we are in a world now where, Again, there is just because of the control is now with the audience as into how, where, what, when they want to watch it, how quickly they want to watch and consume the content because that's in control by the audience. Now it's it's completely flipped the paradigm of you know creating content for an audience. So, so Sean, do you ever like you know uh, watch YouTube or, or any of those other you know? Uh... Uh, you know, content, uh, you know, outlets that you have access that, you know, we all have access to. And do you ever like, you know, watch something on there and think, you know, oh, hey, this person, th- you know, uh, uh, you watch YouTube short, for instance, and you say to yourself, wow, this person should, you know, with the right, you know, team behind him, him or her, you know, they could, they, they should be making feature length films. I mean, do you ever, do you ever find like, you know, people to work with that way? Um, absolutely. Uh, in fact, um, 
one of the reasons why I love the way that Buck Productions has grown over the years is it's grown with a very diversified portfolio. And if you look at our portfolio, you'll see a company that's not just, oh, we do this and oh, yeah, yeah, we can do that. It's like, no, no, no. We have, you know, we've made over 25 feature films and we have created and made over 50 unscripted shows and we've done 12 documentaries and scripted series. And you know what? We've been pioneering branded content for close to a decade. And then over here, we'll bang out a whole ton of awesome commercials or smaller digital series for consumption on YouTube and, you know, other outlets. But in it, what the true value of this diversified portfolio is it's a talent beacon, just as you mentioned. You know, I'm always looking for talent, always, because those voices, that talent is uh, now, because of these reduced barriers to entry, they can be seen. There, you know, there was a time where you, you just you couldn't get your work through the machine, but now you can. And that is that's a fantastic byproduct of access to technology that can allow you to do what it is that you want to do, show the world your voice. So back to the buck model, I've got these divisions and I'm constantly mining, um, you know, amazing directors or storytellers that might be over here working on a cool digital series um, for uh, a feature film. Or I might be over here and say, wow, this documentary team that I just worked with is like so cinematic, so so has such a gorgeously sincere way of storytelling that I want them over here on an unscripted show doing, show doing all the recreates. And now you're seeing voices migrating from um, different silos of media. Uh, and that's where you're starting to see things that are really fresh. And that's what I really love doing. So past what we're doing in our own diversified portfolio, yes. I'm constantly looking at the landscape of creators. And it could be something as simple as whatever, a, a, not, not a TikTok, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but something in YouTube that is just, you know, because you know what's great about it, and, I, and this is what I love, is I can go out to a garage sale tomorrow and I can buy a guitar for 20 bucks and the guitar is fine. And I will come home and I will play it and people will want to, um, you know, take the guitar and smash it over a counter because it's so horrible. Um, so there I am. I've accessed the concept of being a guitar player, but I can't do it. And, and I am really, really bad. People are accessing the ability to create content and execute content, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're talented. Um, where you're finding people's voices pierce through the white noise that is out there is because they are talented. And you're watching something that just moves you. And you're not in a situation where you have to say, well, how much did that cost? How much did it take you to make? Where did you, like, you can ask all those questions. Um, but it's really at the end of the day, regardless, like, you know, is it a $120 million superhero movie that moved you? Or is it this small cinematic short film on YouTube that, you know, moved you? And the audience is now um, more than ever in kind of control of that. You know, you mentioned the diverse portfolio. Uh, I did notice that, by the way, Sean, because I, you know, I, I recognize Wolf Cop. Um, I saw that and I was like, oh, Wolf Cop. I go, you know, and it just I started looking at everything else that, that you have done. And that kind of jumped out because not only, uh, you know, have I seen that a few times, but also uh, it just it seems so different from everything else, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dirty, hairy, only hairier. Had, had to make that movie. Had to make it. Um, and, you know, the team that I made it with was incredible. Um, but interestingly enough is uh, the w Wolf Cop was the product of something else that we've um, built. Uh, and I built this with partners. Um, and that company is called the Coup Company. And I don't uh, – I I um, – I've been building it with uh, Jay Jolly and Brian Weed and my two partners and some other partners. And it's a, it, it is and it isn't a separate thing than Buck. Buck is a, an owner in it. But what I saw in the Coup Company was yet again pressing the perimeters of um, innovation. And the Coup Company um, is a disruptive model that we basically said, hey, um, out there, we want, to, uh, we want to make an independent film. We want to open up the, a coup, and the coup is called Cinecoup. 
We have a million dollars in financing, and we have um, a theatrical coast-to-coast distribution with our partners here in Canada called Cineplex. And we now open Cineku, and we want you to come forward, director, producer, and digital social media head. We want you to come forward with your film. So what we did is a very disruptive incubator that lived online, and we we were out there hunting <clears throat> for exactly what we found, Wolf Cop. Now, 90 films came in, and uh, they said, well, where do we send the script? We, go, we don't want the script. We want your trailer. So all of a sudden, you know, great. Now, again, no barriers to entry. Guys are out there making trailers, like literally hobbling together a team, getting the technology, shooting their trailer. And when a few when a people, you know, some more veteran filmmakers would call and say, well, I, you want a trailer? I need ten or $15,000. It's like, well, then, you know, Syndicate is not for you. This is a very innovative distribution, disruptive model. Well, team like, teams like Lowell Dean, who, who started out of the gate with Wolf Cop, um, you know, they got it. And they put together a trailer that blew our mind. And over a 16-week period, we created... Um, we started with 90 and then moved to, you know, 25 and then down to 10. And then the top five films over a 16-week mission-based model, which was give us, show us the poster, was your marketing plan. We developed, um, fully developed numerous properties and then flew the top five teams to the Whistler Film Festival, which is a whole bunch of fun if you ever get a chance to check it out. And through our judging panel um, and through the fan support, like, again, the coups are, Cine is about, you know, fans making movies for fans. Like, it's, they're the ones that are telling us, we want more, we want Wolf Cop. Like, they're the ones who we're making the movie for. And so it's like, hey, rather than sit in a room and say, I think they really want a romantic comedy. It's like, no. Let's build a model that tells us what they want. And of the top five teams, <clears throat> it was loud and clear. People wanted us to make Wolf Cop. So that's what we did. And Lowell Dean and his team came from a small town in Saskatchewan, which, I, you know, to this day, I don't think without something like a, a Sinecu or the coup model, um, we're may, or we're finding the talent, the amazing talent, and the idea, which was Wolf Cop. So it's funny you touched on that particular film because that's exactly how we got the opportunity to make it. Well, and you know, I wanted to ask too. You know, when, when you make something like Wolf Cop, you know, do you do you feel that you know, as we talk about content creation and everything and standing out, do you feel that you almost have to make something like that in in the marketplace right now, where just you know, not only does the name sell it to you because it's it's exactly what you think it is. It's, it's a wolf cop, a werewolf that's a cop. Um, yep. But do you think that also just it helps to stand out? I mean, if when the marketplace, whether it be on Netflix or et cetera, just gets too crowded and then you can just say, here's something completely different. It's not a big budget, you know, a, a superhero movie. Um, and it's, you know, it's something that you could put on uh, and um, it's exactly what it says it is. And you know what I mean? And so it, 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 it stands out on its own just by the sheer premise of it. It's almost like the premise is a character of itself. Yeah, you know, you have to get through a, you have to get through a sniff test really quickly in the current landscape of content. Like you, you know, you know, and I like to call it a a whiffum test. It's like immediately when they see it, it's like, well, what's in it for me? Literally, and you have a very short window of time nowadays because the choices of what it is that they want to do. Forget content. Oh, I'm going to go right back and play Fortnite or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that or I'm going to listen to an awesome, you know, podcast like yours or I'm going to do, you know, there, there are so many things drawing at people um, time uh, and content consumption choices. So your with them test, what's in it for me is like hyper narrow. So you've got to come into that world with something that does exactly that. Wolf cop. <laughs> oh, my goodness. This film looks hilarious uh i'm in um but also it's not always necessarily um loud or or like wolf cop is a is a big idea we loved it because it's an ip it's an intellectual property now in the world of wolf you know werewolf cops that is our ip like a like a teenage mutant ninja turtles and you know we're doing some really exciting stuff like that well we, we made the sequel another wolf cop and we're doing other things but as you move back to that um, question, 
you know, there's still other audiences that their whiff of test, what's in it for me, is not, I want loud, crazy, you know, funny. I, I understand what the concept of the film is right out of the gate by the title. It's something like Astronaut, which is a film we just finished, um, which is, um, you know, with Richard Dreyfus and Graham Greene and Colm Fjord. And, and we, it's a film about a, an elderly gentleman who's still got a dream. And the messaging in the film is, you know, dreams don't have expiry dates. So there is an audience for that. And their whiff them is, wow, I actually want to kind of see. There's not a lot of films that are made for an older audience. And I don't want to go to the theater and watch some dude in a cape. That's just not my thing. But I do want to see a story that's grounded in some really great messaging, incredible performances by great actors, and just at the you know core of it, a really good story. So being that, you know, you, you kind of have, you know, the, uh, the, the movies that fans want to see, does that help you, uh, you know, Sean, when, you know, I, I'm guessing, I want to say about investors, you know, when you're pitching to investors, do, do you ever, is it easier or is it harder because you're, you're a diverse film company? Because, you know, some film companies say, hey, look, we only do horror. Um, some of them mm-hmm. say we only do drama. So does it kind of like hurt you or does it help you being so diverse? Um, it helps us. Um, and it helps us in the structuring out of a business model. I've always been fascinated with the concept of um, the, 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 if you look at a, a spectrum and on one side of the spectrum is creativity and on the other side of the spectrum is business acumen or business knowledge. And it's weird, but you know, so much of the world feels that you're either operating in this column call it left brain, right brain, but you're operating as this creative or you're operating as this kind of, you know, nuts and bolts accounting business guy. But my world, the world that I've always lived in is one that I think is, is going to become more and more relevant. And that is right in the middle. That's where you understand business. I mean, like Buck Productions is a business. Our product is content. That's what we make. But, you know, our product to make it revolve, you know, needs a tremendous amount of creativity and you know and that's the gift of you know that's that's our focus on storytelling and it's just films and that's that's tv shows and that's digital series and that's standing on a set doing a commercial right it's i mean our widget if you will i'm not trying to downplay what it is that we do but our business widget is we you know we make content so by building a company that is diversified um, what that allowed me to do is, A, still focus on what it is that I want to do, because storytelling for me doesn't stop at a 30-second commercial, and it doesn't have to be in a 90-minute feature. It can be in an eight-part, six-minute each web series about young entrepreneurs that we did for Infinity. And, you know, the storytelling there is, I don't want to spend any more time than six minutes with this awesome entrepreneur. But now all of a sudden you start looking at the business model that is Buck. And as uh, you know, in the marketplace now is what it's done is it's given us, when I say us, our team, the opportunity to be selective in a sense. So as investors come to us or opportunities come to us or scenarios are presented is because we're moving through the ebbs and flows of production, like, oh, we're going to take a little, you know, we're, we're, it's going to take us a while to put together that film. But while we're doing that, we're going to make two unscripted shows and some branded content and a scripted series. We're moving through other production. Um, that's the business component of it. And giving us the opportunity to be a little bit more selective uh, in what projects we choose to focus on, what projects we want to get behind, rather than we have to do that project. We got to, you know, all we do is horror movies that's it that's all we make so every horror movie that comes at us we got to do um that that's actually been a very very uh it's given you us a position of not a yeah, position of strength to play a little bit from you know, for, we can get to play from the balls of our feet and be wise about a the company's strategic partners investors and or content that we want to work on yeah, I, I, and, and that makes total sense. Um, you know, I, it just I, I've seen you know a lot of the the companies that have come out like you know that they only do certain certain movies. 
um, or certain genres, I should say. And then you, you kind of get that we just alluded to, where it's like you know you almost have to do everything that's thrown at you uh, because you kind of, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you're kind of uh, down a, a a a street, I guess, but you, and you want to be you know very good at that one wheelhouse, but at the same time, it kind of. Uh, you know, you're kind of at the at the mercy, so to speak, of whatever the market is for that genre at the time. Uh, but granted, I mean, there's always a genre for horror, though. There's always, a, I mean, there's always yeah. a market for horror, though. We just finished a movie called Making Monsters, which is exactly that. I'm, I'm very proud of it, and it's a, it's a, you know, funny is it's it's two directors um, that had worked with me on a, one of our unscripted series, but their work on the uh, recreate recreate stuff was exceptional. And I just like them, and they're fantastic. And they had done three short films and had uh, received some tremendous um, accolades from the short film festivals. And they approached me to say, like, can we, you know, Sean, would you help us make this other short? And I said, you know what, guys, uh, um, you graduated. You don't need to make another short. You've done that. Open this concept up to a feature, and let's go there. And that's exactly what we did. You know, we, we put together a script, and they did, and you know, wrote a fantastic story. And we made a movie called Making Monsters. And in it, yeah, I'm looking at the landscape of horror, and it's horror. And we've been out to all the film festivals, and it's done very, very well. But yeah, no, that's 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 uh, it's a space that we do play in for sure. And you're right, there, as you say, the the world has a well. Again, we're right back to this ferocious appetite, right? It has a ferocious appetite for um, for horror. So you know, Sean, just to you know, kind of as we kind of go along here with with your whole career and how to and how you you kind of built up your your own studio, you know, what advice would you give somebody who was just starting, you know, right now who wanted to do something similar to what you've done? Um, work ethic. You know, it's like I didn't go to uh, I didn't go to film school, um, and and I'm not I'm not saying that film school is not a great idea. I just wasn't you know, it wasn't an opportunity that I had before me. But I think at the end of the day is, you, you know, you have to, there's two things. You have to be prepared in this particular business to to really, really work hard. And, it, you know, and you got to love it because anything, you know, because you, you got to go all in. And in building your own business, um, you know, that's, that's, you have to be smart about it and you have to kind of build it out. As I've mentioned, that is a hybrid. It's a business. It's treated as a business. You know, you take the word show out of show business. Um, and, uh, and, and again, just work, work really, really hard. And the, the, then if that scares you, the other thing I would add to that comment is the concept of um, the minimum minimization of regrets. So I'm, I'm, you know, here's 25 years later, and Buck Productions has, you know, been an incredible adventure, and I've kind of got to do exactly what I love to do, and I've worked with some incredible uh, teams of people. And when I look at our what our legacy is, if you will, as a company, uh, the fact that I'm, you know, meeting you for the first time and you're talking about one of our films and you've watched it and you loved it, it's like that's our legacy. We, you know, we've created a portfolio of work that has touched people, um, and <clears throat> what. Well, but the the minimization of regret has always been something that I think people should really tuck in there in their decision to to do it, like to soldier on. Because when you're looking back, back at you know at your life, and you know you're you're saying, "Wow, um, I just always think about minimization of regret." Like I don't want to look back at my life and say, "Wow, I was I was afraid to work too hard to try to build that company from nothing." And now I'm had a great life, and I've done this, and I've worked here, and this was my gig, and it was awesome. But at the end of the day, I kind of regret that decision. Well, if you're operating under the concept of minimization of regret, um, then you know what? You're going to throw yourself into that situation, that scenario. You're going to throw yourself into that opportunity and work really, really hard to see it through. So, you know, and also we touched upon it you know, when we started this, you know, now with with there's no barriers to entry, like this podcast, for instance, you know, there's no podcast headquarters, for instance. It's just, a, you know what I mean? It's just a digital recording that is put up onto uh, a Podbean and, it's, and, you know, there is no real barrier to entry to this, um, which I talk about all the time, especially in podcasting, Sean. Podcasting, the barrier to entry is so low that it's almost like I'm shocked when somebody doesn't have a podcast. 
Yeah. No, I, I listen. I, but I keep. I gotta tell you, I keep picturing you sitting in a two thousand square foot state of the art studio. Just so you know, David. Well, you, you, you know, it's funny, Sean. I started this podcast in a like two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollars studio. Um, I actually had a friend who actually had a studio and was like, "Hey, you want to use it?" And I said, "Sure." And I started all of this in there, and now I'm sitting here in my little office. Uh, doing this, so I've kind of yeah. gone. I've gone the reverse method, Sean. I started out in a really nice studio, and now I'm, <laughs> now I'm in a in a thing in my house. But uh, it's actually easier in my house, though. I don't have to go anywhere. You know what? Listen, it's like it's odd, but you know, look at the cultural shift in um, in exactly that. You know that that like access. It's like okay, well, guess what? You know, you talked about how did you? Well, I started up a a company, and then you know the people that you know individuals and clients need to come to a bricks and mortar kind of a place because you know what now all of a sudden you were real you were a real company right versus we work look at the look at the companies concepts ideas strategies that are getting birthed from places like we work where you know there is no big bricks and mortar play how about this how about the idea um be it your podcast or us you know how about jk rowling writing harry potter in a coffee shop you know, there's no bricks and mortar there. It's, you know, it's, and that's, that I think gives, again, you know, um, again, levels the playing field, but gives creators wings in a sense. You know, they're not labored down with, well, I got to have this to be real or be, it's like, hey, you don't, you need less. You need less and you can create more nowadays, which I love. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's definitely true. I think, um, it's just something I've been experimenting with too. It's just you know when you approach different people, don't approach different companies, or even you know trying to go to YouTube. Um, you know, I, I know some companies do want to see a trailer, kind of like you were alluding to with Wolf Comp. Um, other companies, you know, they do want to see. You know, maybe they do want to read the script first. You know what I mean? Oh, they do. Listen, that well, the Cineku model, the coup model, is something very different. We've worked, with, we've done numerous coups now. We've done a coup for a sitcom. Um, that that's a that's an awesome model, all you know, tech based. That we're that I'm, I just as a serial entrepreneur, I saw the model. I wanted to invest in it and build it with the team that was working on it. But listen, there's a very there is a another model, um, you know that you know Milton's Secret the film we just did a couple years ago. Um, that started in a very traditional model. I'd read Eckhart Tolle. I loved The Power of Now. I loved the concept of being present. I wanted his work to be on the big screen. So <clears throat> we, you know, we worked, you know, work out the script. We worked the script. We worked with Eckhart Tolle and we took his book, Milton's Secret, which is, you know, conceptually The Power of Now and being present and anti-bullying. And, you know, we're making a movie with Donald Sutherland and Michelle Rodriguez and, um, and very, and again, very proud of that work, you know, very proud of the message that it is. I mean, it's extending a, a powerful message into the big screen and into the content consumption landscape of a film. So people are getting that message and not having to read the power of now or Milton's secret, um, and Eckhart's message is out there. So, but that's a very un, you know, that's an undisruptive, that's a very traditional start with the script, work the script get the script right, build the machine, bring in the financing, make the movie. Yes. Yeah, it, it is. Um, and, I, and I think, too, like, you know, I, I, again, as different, the different avenues are kind of, um, I, I want to say fleshed out. As different avenues are kind of fleshed out, um, I, I think you are going to see, you know, more of um, different, different ways that people can now actually, you know, maybe – they don't have to make if they have if they already have a script or if they have an idea they don't necessarily have they don't have to go that model you know what I mean like if they don't have they don't have to go to uh, a studio they could do or uh, they could go, do something like with uh, a YouTube channel um, I see a lot of, I, you know I see a lot of stuff with like YouTube now um, th- especially with um, I forget the guy's name I just mentioned him the other day uh, but anyways he did lights out uh, David Stein- Steinfeld this, I forget, uh, but he did lights out. Like he did a bunch of trailers on YouTube, and then he got pulled. He he, uh, you know, made a feature film out of it. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of what we were talking about before, where you kind of have a proof of concept or a trailer, and then you can actually flesh out into a whole movie if you if you can go that route. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, you know, and and it's funny, but if you think about it, is you look at 
you know, here's Martin Scorsese. You know, you, you, you look at now, again, on a totally different scale, Martin Scorsese can't get The Irishman made. No studio's touching it. Nobody. Nobody wants to spend the money. Nobody wants, you know, nobody's going to back that thing. Um, it's De Niro, it's Joe Pesci, it's Scorsese, arguably one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. It's, it's, it's wheelhouse. It's, you know, it's casino, it's Goodfellas. It's based on an unbelievable book and it takes the OTT, it takes Netflix, right? It takes the disruptive model of, you know, what that is to come in and say, Hey, um, here's a, here's a, here's a filmmaker and a team of actors that are, you know, about as, if you were to say for a certain audience, about as bankable as you can bank and the studios aren't touching it yet. Netflix does. And in that model, they make the Irishman, which, you know, does a small theatrical run and is now boom out on. So it takes some, it takes a disruptive model. It takes a new, new concept for a, for a more established team of filmmakers. Now, like, so there's the young that are finding themselves on YouTube and breaking in. Here's an established filmmaker and established actress, and I mean as about established as one can be, having to go through Netflix to get the movie that they really want to make out there. Yeah, I actually just saw that too on because I, I have Netflix. Uh, have you seen The Irishman yet? I have, and it, you know it's long, uh, and it's um, but it's listen, it's it's a it's I thought it was fantastic. It's beautiful. It's like it's it's some of the it's some of the best. Um, individuals, uh, you know, in the world of filmmaking, you know, sharing their craft with you. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, it's I, well, you know, whenever the that De Niro uh, and, uh, and Scorsese and, and Pesci get together, the movie becomes like three hours. You know, it's kind of like a rule. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you. you know, I say it is a rule. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's long. It's long. Okay, it's, for sure. Yeah, it's guys Casino and Goodfellas, and now and now uh, the Irishman. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you know. Um, you know, just just hearing about the whole story about that coming out. You know, now Netflix is is a you know is a is a whole model now for for you know f- filmmakers to go to um, because I remember when Netflix first started. Uh, true story, Sean. I remember when Netflix Netflix first started. I had, I had a couple friends who actually got movies picked up by them, and the reason they ha- got picked up was because I don't know if you remember this or not, but Netflix used to let you submit movies to them. They weren't, and it wasn't hidden either. Like there was a, a button on the website that said, submit your movie here. And that's how a couple of my friends got submitted, uh, or sorry, got, got distribution by Netflix in the early days. And uh, they still use that to their credit. So like whenever, you know, 10, 15 years now, uh, they, they, they use that to get their foot in the door. They're like, oh, by the way, you know, I've had a movie on Netflix. And, you know, yeah. like, and people are like, holy shit, really? Oh my God. Right. No, that's it. Listen, that's great. Listen, the con- talk, you know, like at one point, Netflix was a business that would mail DVDs to you. You know, at one point, Netflix was almost acquired by Blockbuster. Mm-hmm. Think about that. Blockbuster is like, you know, that archaic model of you have to go to a store, stand in line, take a VHS tape, bring it home, plug it in your system or your DVD and watch it and then make sure that you return it or you're going to get paid a, a late charge. Crazy, but you know, again, when Netflix was breaking and being disruptive and breaking through, and you know, mailing DVDs to homes, um, this this you know this OTT model comes through, and now look at it, the Great Red Tide, as it is called. Yeah, it's uh, it definitely has, yeah the whole everything has changed. Um, you know, I, I think I, I have some friends of mine and myself. I think we're the only people left who still maybe buy Blu-rays when they come out the physical media. <laughs> um, but uh, but listen, hey, that's that's collector that's collectors, and I will say this: um, I love seeing stuff like like in a sense, I mean, life is cyclical, or art is cyclical, or the world is cyclical, and you know you're looking at vinyl sales going through the roof. People want because there's been a massive generation that is that that doesn't like when they say own content, it's like. There's something about lifting that Blu-ray up, holding it, touching it, physically touch, putting it in a machine, looking at the additional components, you know, content offerings that it has on it. I mean, you drop that needle on a piece of vinyl, you know, there's, you know, you know, there's an audience that has never touched music. It's just Spotify. It's the Apple playlist. It's this. I want to hear this song right now. Put it on, you know, versus 
taking a record out of a sleeve, touching it, physically putting it on something, listening it to, to the music fill the room. That's that's an analog experience that is, I mean, I think is coming back strong. And when you look at things like, I'm not sure about Blu-ray sales, but when you look at vinyl sales, you know, they're just increasing, you know, they're going through the roof. Yeah, you know, I, I have a friend of mine, uh, I ju- you know, he has a lot of, of, you know, physical media. And I asked him, I said, how many Blu-rays do you have? And he actually has a catalog of every single uh, a Blu-ray that he has. And he just is shy of 10,000 Blu-rays. Jeez, where does he keep it all? <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he, it's, I'm glad you asked that, Sean. It's, it's, uh, I, uh, his, so he has a house all to himself. And it, it, it's basically like a, uh, a Best Buy warehouse in there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, some some <laughs> some people would call that hoarding, but no, I hear what you mean. As long as it's organized, it's not hoarding. <laughs> yeah, well, well I, I told him that. I said, I I said, I think you're at the verge now, where like, if if like a pile of these Blu-rays were to fall on you, I said, I think that it would be like days before anybody found you. And he and he started <laughs> laughing. He's like, Yeah, that's probably true. It's almost like you know. Uh, in like one of those hoarder shows where the guy gets, you know, un, you know, they start unearthing stuff and they find like just like people buried underneath there under the mountain of Blu-rays. Yeah, that, that'd be a great question. OK, so if you were to pick the top 100 films to crush you, what would they be in your pile of Blu-rays? <laughs> no. But you know what? Listen, that's that's content. I mean, that's an individual who whatever appreciates content and like that's. And that's no different than your, you know, listen, I own a ton of movies. I just own them now digitally. And, you know, I have a digital suitcase of films. You know, listen, and there's something very cool about going to Apple TV. And I do this all the time, like Wolf Cop or, or you saw Wolf Cop on Netflix. But, you know, you go to your, you go, you, you've worked very hard to make a film. And, um, you know, the team that you've put together and that you've worked hard with, um, you know, there's a real celebration of getting, you know, getting that story, that that piece of content out there. And there's something very cool about um, just as a filmmaker about going to Apple TV and seeing it up there. And, you know, you and I purchase it, purchase my own film and I drop it and put it into, you know, a purchased portfolio because I don't know, there's something about, um, you know, it. it it, it, it being out there to find audiences. I mean, that's at the end of the day why you do it. Yeah, it, it's by the way, just to mention too that the whole uh, <laughs> movies to crush you. It's like yeah, forget forget about the movies. Uh, your top ten, uh, top one hundred island lists. It's uh, movies yeah. on a desert island. Just get the hundred movies that'll crush you to death and be like, go from there. <laughs> that, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> no, just I, I was just laughing at that. That was, uh, but uh, but yeah, you know, you, you're absolutely right. You know, Sean and. Uh, you know, I mean, we, you know, we've been talking for about, you know, about an hour or so. So I wanted to ask, you know, kind of in closing is, you know, is there anything you wanted to say to, to, to put a period at the end of this whole conversation? I uh, appreciate the time, David. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, it's the one thing is, um, is uh, that I like is the, the concept of um, looking back and, you know, when I look at the portfolio of what Buck has created, um, and I've got the I've got the advantage of looking at it from 25 years, and <clears throat> the journey is the the one resounding component about all of it is um, is that that minimization of regret. Like these young content makers is don't don't be don't tread lightly into it. Don't be fearful. If you have a voice and you have a story and you want to tell it and you're you believe in yourself uh, now more than ever. Um, you know, there's an opportunity to do it and outlets to get it on. And is it competitive? Absolutely. Competitive as one could ever imagine. But whatever, it's it's always been competitive because as we discussed at the beginnings of this conversation, the bar- it's all about barriers to entry. And, you know, it, you know, if you did not have a 35 mil camera, you were not making a movie, period, full stop. And if you couldn't get it cut on a $250,000 editing suite called an avid you weren't assembling it so those were all challenging things to navigate um and they they're no longer here so it's just it's but you know there's more players it's more competitive if you will i would so i would just say you know like if you look at the portfolio of buck 
um, super proud of it, super proud of the teams that I've had the great fortune of working with. And uh, I look back and it's like, you know what? I've enjoyed and still got lots to do, but I've really enjoyed um, the experience, the adventure, and the opportunity to play in the landscape of storytelling, which is something really that I just always wanted to do. And, and that's kind of the prize, you know what I mean, Sean, where you, you get to do what you love and, uh, you know, especially in this, in this market, in this industry, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's, it's tough, but if you can do it, more power to you, right? Absolutely. <laughs> hey, Sean, where do people find you at online? Uh, buckproductions.com. Well, we're on Instagram. Buck Productions uh, is on Instagram. Um, and we're kind of updating people um, primarily through Instagram. Uh, we're on Facebook, Buck Productions. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of us. And <clears throat> we're, um, you know, if you want to check out our work, uh, our portfolios of work are at, at our website. And we're always updating kind of what we're doing out there and, and some of the cool stuff that we're working on on social. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.